Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. So I've talked before about the importance of not talking to the police. And one question I get in response to that is, hey, Runkle, come on, surely there's a point where you have to talk to the police. And there absolutely is. However, you need to be aware that any time you talk to the police, there's some risk. And to illustrate that, I'm going to give a personal anecdote here of a time recently when I called the police. So I did a video a while back on testing various household sprays and their potential usefulness, or if you watch the video, lack thereof as self-defense sprays. I'm not a huge fan of these sort of internet myths that go around, but you know, people talk about, oh, you should, you know, spray something with, you know, raid or whatever else. Uh, again, watch the video. I'm not a super fan of that. Uh, but part of that video was doing testing on cow eyeballs. So somebody watched that video or about the first eight seconds of it. And they heard that I was going to be testing these sprays on cow eyeballs. And they assumed that I meant that I was going to be doing this with a live cow. And they stopped watching because they didn't want to see that. And they were horrified by this notion. And so uh, as a result of this assumption, they decided to send me some very explicit threats as to that they were going to come find me and, you know, spray chemicals in my eyes and various other things. Now, you know, obviously I'm not going to spray things into a live cow for a whole lot of reasons. The first, that's messed up. Um... The next one is I weigh 130 pounds and I'm pretty sure a cow can take me in a fight and would absolutely murder the heck out of me for that. Um, I also don't know of any farmer on the planet who if I said, hey, you know what? I see you've got these cows. I'd really like to spray them with some unknown chemicals. Are you down with that? Would be like, you know what? Sure, go for it. So, and I'm certainly not going to buy a cow for that purpose because... Cows are not cheap. Cows are, in fact, the opposite of cheap. They are very expensive. So no part of this assumption makes any sense whatsoever. Um, yeah, it was obviously I'm not going to be using a live cow. These were cow eyeballs that were removed from cows that were processed as part of the beef industry. So the cow, you know, met its end. Otherwise, I was just saving these eyeballs from either the garbage or probably the dog food uh, route. So anyway, um, but that person didn't watch enough of the video to realize that I was using, you know, removed cow eyeballs that are really no different than if I was spraying a steak. And they got very upset. So they sent me a very threatening email. And I thought, uh, I don't really know how to deal with this. And so one of the things I contacted the police and said, hey, uh, I got this email. I don't think it's a big worry, but maybe look into it if you feel like it. And I really didn't expect them to do much with it because quite frankly, investigating things that happen over the internet is hard. So um, I sent them all that and didn't get a response for a long time, which is really what I expected because it's not a huge deal at the end of the day. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, they're going to have a very tough time tracking that down. In the meantime, I also engaged in some dialogue with this person and was able to clear up their misconceptions about, you know, where these cow eyes had come from. And we actually came to a fairly amicable resolution, which is they basically said, okay, cool, I, I'm sorry, I jumped to conclusions, my bad. So I don't bear this person any ill will. Uh, I don't know if they're watching, but hopefully they don't bear me any ill will. Um... I'm entirely fine with the police never tracking this person down because at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? But I got a call uh, not too long ago, just sort of last week from a constable who was following up and basically saying, has there been any further developments? And I was able to say, yeah, the further developments are, we worked it out. I don't care anymore. I'm not sure I ever really cared that much. Um, you know, don't worry about it. And uh, they said, well, great. And they mentioned that they're a constable who is assigned to animal abuse cases. And I went, huh, how about that? And they mentioned as well in the course of our brief conversation that uh, I had been cleared uh, in their investigation. So what that means, of course, is that 
because of the fact that I reported the threats against me, uh, they also investigated whether or not they wanted to charge me with anything. Now, when I made the, uh, the initial report, I knew that was a possibility. In fact, I kind of expected that outcome. And, you know, I made the report knowing that my content in the video and in other videos is 100% above board, that there is no criminal activity going on. And, you know, certainly I'm not in the habit of committing crimes at all, or especially committing crimes, putting them on video, and then putting them on the internet, because that would be incredibly dumb. Who videos themselves committing crimes? Um, I'm not going to... That one gets me too much into politics. I'm just going to move on from that one. So, you know, videoing yourself committing crimes would be dumb, and so that's not something I do. But... They went and investigated me to see if there were any charges to be laid against me with respect to that video, and they ultimately concluded that there were not. But you see, uh, because I made that report, I also drew police attention to myself. There's plenty of situations where people have called the police looking for help and found themselves being charged. Uh, one that happens fairly often is people who are on bail conditions that require them not to consume alcohol or other drugs. Uh, people breach those conditions all the time because the way you end up with those conditions is that you are a person who has problems with alcohol or drugs. And then we say, stop it. Like, that's going to actually mean much. But sometimes those people end up as victims of an offense. And so they call police for help saying, hey, somebody's beating me up. I need you to come here and stop them from beating me up. And the police show up and that initial person who's, you know, attacking them has left because they've heard that the police are being called. Why would they call the police? You know, why would they hang around? And then the police charge the person who made the report because they've been drinking and they weren't supposed to. Uh, also, in self-defense cases, you know, where you've had to use force in defense of yourself or in defense of your property, the 911 call that you use to bring the police there, maybe bring an ambulance, bring whatever services are needed, uh, that's recorded, and they can absolutely use it against you. So you need to be cautious as to what you're saying on such a, uh, on such a video, or such a phone call, rather. So, you know, my case can illustrate that even when you need help, there is risk to calling the police, and there's risk in being incautious about what you say to the police. Now, does that mean don't call the police? Well, clearly not, because, I mean, I did, and the police fill a valuable role in society. You know, they are quite often necessary. There's often no substitute for the police in a particular scenario. But that doesn't mean that you should just, you know, Never forget the police don't work for you. Even if you're the one who calls them, the police work for the police. And so, you know, they may investigate the crime you call them about, but they may also investigate other crimes that they detect or that they think have happened. Be aware of that possibility. It is always a risk and, you know, one you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of. So, again, the lesson is not don't call the police, and it's not don't ever talk to the police. But it's be really cautious about what you say to the police and, you know, in what contexts. Certainly, if the police have their sights already aimed at you, you know, if you are the prime suspect in anything, you know, if they're talking to you because they suspect you of a crime, uh, the proper thing to do is call a lawyer to get advice, and that lawyer will then, you know, tell you, keep your mouth shut. Uh, if you can't reach a lawyer and you don't know what to do, the correct answer is to keep your mouth shut until you can talk to a lawyer and get that advice. So, you know, because the lawyer may say something else. I There's very rare circumstances where they would, but you want to talk to a lawyer and you want to, unless you have specific advice otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope that this little anecdote has been, you know, helpful. I hope it's sort of illustrated uh, some of the pitfalls that can come up. So in particular, I wanted to address the somewhat dangerous myth some people have 
that essentially when you call the police that you sort of own those police or that, you know, they're your police in some fashion. That's not the case. They're just police. They're going to do police things, which, you know, may well be investigating what you want them to, but it also probably includes investigating things that you don't want them to. So be aware of that whenever you have contact with the police. There is always some risk that if they get it into their heads, you know, for good reasons or bad reasons, that you may have committed an offense, that you may end up uh, being charged. In particular, uh, this is a this is a risk for gun owners because, you know, if you have something where your firearms are mentioned, the police will probably want to see them. And, you know, if those firearms are not properly stored and properly, you know, kept up, uh, you may well end up facing charges with respect to that. So thank you for watching. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to see more content. Uh, I've also got a link to a GoFundMe with respect to Section 74 appeals that are going on in Ontario. People are trying to raise funds so that they can have counsel assisting them, which I think is important for this kind of thing. Uh, I also want to thank my Patreon subscribers at the $50 level, Demo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, and Kyle Martin. At the $20 level, Dale Nesbitt, Kevin Fleet, Cameron Johnson, and Andrew Elsich. And at the $10 level, uh, Ma Buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, TR, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, John Alexandra Tessier, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter H., Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Mark D, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, DF, Stacey Cartmel, Tactical Advantage TV Canada, Ian S, Dave Leslie, Juan, Stephen Conquist, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Pete H, Chris Trombley, Ian Hutchinson, Travis, BC Bushcraft Leather, John Singarty, Misa Komarevich, all Systems Go, David Moga, Ian Hedgedanik, Hello from Venezuela, Taylor Delnea, Rod Guzman, Matthew Nesbitt, Conway Yuri, Toronto Airsoft, James Cox, Zip Ties and Bias Plies, Daniel Kang, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Richard, Brock Watts, Frog, uh, Frog Clan Copper, Annika Bain, Tim McGill, Jordan Delaney, Rob Butts, Chris Joseph, Grant Farquhar, Malcolm Yogi, Roberto Selbach, DiMaco, Texan Diesel, Prairie Prepper 777, uh, Kevin Fleet, Scott Rasmussen, Matt. And uh, if you are, sometimes I get contacted by people who say, I want to contribute, but I don't want to be in the shout out. Uh, if that's, you know, your situation, just let me know, drop me a line uh, when you sign up and I'm happy to leave you out if that's uh, your preference. But uh, thank you once again for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge.